the most important thing they will ask you is very few things let us see first the etiology of the lymphadenopathy the moment you call i mean you wanted to know about the etiology of the lymphadenopathy i used to give by a criteria called miami criteria subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from prep ladder let us finish off some of the important aspects of the lymphadenopathy also so first the most important thing they will ask you is very few things let us see first the etiology of the lymphadenopathy the moment you call i mean you wanted to know about the etiology of the lymphadenopathy i used to give by a criteria called miami criteria so miami is the mnemonic i used to give and many i mean some standard textbooks also give this i mean mnemonic so m stands for malignancy and i stands for infection A stands for autoimmune. A stands for autoimmune. And uh, M stands for miscellaneous. Here the next M stands for miscellaneous. And uh, I is going to stand for iatrogenic. Iatrogenic. So let us see some of the important causes. When you call about the malignancy, malignancy is a very important reason for a lymphadenopathy. Many malignancies can cause lymphadenopathy. For example, you have uh, a lymphoma. Lot of lymphomas are there. Lot of leukemias, but leukemias causing lymphadenopathy is generally rare, but possible. So leukemias can cause. You have something called amyloidosis, can cause. Sorry, sorry, it's not a neoplasm. So leukemias. Then you have something called metastatic carcinomas. metastatic cancers so these are the three things that are going to produce lymphadenopathy malignancy causing lymphadenopathy then what about the infection a whole lot of infections are there so i can split into number 1 into a viral infection very typically you can see in epstein barr virus infection monoculus hiv persistent generalized lymphadenopathy then you can see in hsv cmv then varicella zoster virus measles rubella hepatitis viruses lot of viruses can cause lymphadenopathy but i am oriented towards ebv and hiv only because that is what exam points are ebv hiv mostly viral infections with lymphadenopathy means we go for ebv and hiv only even though many other things can cause then second one you have bacterial infections bacterial infections means then you can split into generalized lymphadenopathy and you have localized lymphadenopathy when you have a generalized lymphadenopathy with bacterial infections it more goes towards brucellosis tuberculosis syphilis atypical mycobacterium atypical mycobacteria probably very rarely leptospirosis these are the areas where you go for generalized lymphadenopathy especially tb syphilis brucellosis these are the usual reasons where you see generalized lymphadenopathy with the bacterial infection localized lymphadenopathy very commonly you see in pharyngitis pharyngitis streptococcal sore throat so streptococcus streptococcus staphylococcus then uh, you can also see in cat scratch disease very important for exams cat scratch disease and francisella tularensis causing tularemia so these are the some of the important conditions where a bacterial infection is causing a uh, lymphadenopathy Number three, you have something called parasitic infections. Parasitic infections causing lymphadenopathy. What do you mean by parasitic infection causing lymphadenopathy? Uh, toxoplasma, very important. Toxoplasma is the most important in this group. Then finally, you have fungal infections causing lymphadenopathy. Fungal infections causing lymphadenopathy are histoplasmosis, coccidioidomycosis, and paracoccidioidomycosis. mycosis so these are the fungal infections that generally causes lymphadenopathy so even blastomycosis sometimes but these are the fungal infections that causes um lymphadenopathy so these are the very important things and here i have utilized a term called generalized and localized what do you mean by generalized and localized actually the definition of generalized and localized is if there are at least two groups are involved two lymph node groups are involved plus they are non contiguous non contiguous so non contiguous in the sense like they should not be next anatomically contiguous next to each other for example an ing cervical and inguinal definitely it is non contiguous only axillary and cervical are actually contiguous so that will not come under generalized but uh, cervical 
plus inguinal. Definitely, it's going to be non-contiguous. Axillary may be involved. That is not an issue. But two non-contiguous groups, if it's involved, then we are going to call it as generalized lymphadenopathy. Localized means it's simple. I mean, any lymph node groups, usually one lymph node group only will be involved. One group usually will be involved. Or you can call two groups may be involved, but it will be anatomically contiguous. This will come under localized lymphadenopathy. And uh, there is another term called persistent lymphadenopathy. Persistent means if it exceeds three months. If the lymphadenopathy exceeds three months, we're going to call it as persistent lymphadenopathy. If you ask persistent generalized means more uh, two or more non-contiguous, anatomically non-contiguous lymph node groups are involved for more than three months, we are going to call it as persistent generalized lymphadenopathy or PGL. These are some of the definitions that you can know. And what about the autoimmune disease? There are a lot of autoimmune diseases that can cause lymphadenopathy. For example, you can see in a lot of connective tissue disorders uh, like uh, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of connective tissue disorders. In fact, the most common extra uh, articular manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis is lymphadenopathy only. So lymphadenopathy is very common in connective tissue disorders. Even Jogren syndrome can produce lymphadenopathy. So connective tissue disorder. Then you can see in um, uh, drug hypersensitivities, you can see in Castleman diseases. Castleman diseases. This, this one I think we can put under miscellaneous. So miscellaneous, you can put your Castleman disease, Castleman disease, Kawasaki disease, then Rosai Dorfman disease, a lot of things are there, low Rosai Dorfman disease, um, then Kikuchi Fujimoto disease, Kikuchi disease. All these things you can put under miscellaneous cause where you can develop lymphadenopathy. Finally, you have this hydrogenic causes producing lymphadenopathy. In this, the most important is the drugs that induce lymphadenopathy, hydrogenic causes. What are the drugs that can cause lymphadenopathy? Uh, first one is allopurinol. Then you have phenytoin. Then you can develop with atinolol. Then you can see with certain drugs like captopril, gold, penicillins, quinidine, primidone, cotrimoxazole, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole combination, and carbamazepine. So these are the drugs that are generally associated with lymphadenopathy, to be honest. But in exam, the most important will be the single most important will be the phenytoin. Phenytoin will be the single most important in exam because it's a multiple time asked question. Many times they have asked in the past and there is a lot of potential to ask in the future also because it is often assessed with something called a pseudolymphoma. Very important. Very, very important point. So many other drugs are also assessed with pseudolymphoma but this is a very important question for exam. That's why phenytoin. Phenytoin and lymphadenopathy are very, very important. So these are some of the important causes. But in general, Miami is the mnemonic easy to remember. Miami means malignancy, uh, then you have uh, infections, autoimmune, then you have uh, miscellaneous group and hydrogenic. In the, the most common if they ask you, infection group. Infection is the commonest reason for getting a lymphadenopathy, most common reason, that is the usual reason. So malignancy is usually lymphoma leukemias, that's why the things that's going to be, and metastasis. And infection, a whole lot of infections, I told you right from TB to HIV, a lot of infections can cause and fungal infections and autoimmune connective disorders. Uh, miscellaneous, know about Kawasaki disease and Castleman disease. Maybe if you want Kikuchi disease and uh, other things you can know. Rosa Dorfman disease and all. Then finally, you have something called uh, hydrogenic. In the drugs, the most important is going to be the phenytoin. So these are the conditions that are going to produce lymphadenopathy. Knowing only the etiology of lymphadenopathy is not really uh, going to help you. What it is going to help you is what are the signs of dangerous lymphadenopathy. That's also very important. So which means what are the reasons where you have to do a biopsy, indications of lymph node biopsy. Number one, age more than 40. Number two, size more than 2 cm. And certain locations, definitely you have to do biopsy. Especially best example is supraclavicular nodes. Supraclavicular nodes are very, very ominous. You know, like we call it Troy's ears and especially if the left supraclavicular node is enlarged, it usually indicates a GI malignancy. Especially ovarian or any other gastrointestinal or pelvic malignancy, very, very ominous sign, Troy's ears sign, supraclavicular nodes. So location is also very important. Then uh, duration. Typically, if it is more than one month, definitely it becomes an indication. And usually if there is presence of B symptoms, presence of B symptoms, 
is also an indication for doing. You know, like B symptoms are the classic, you can imagine like a TB symptom where you have fever, night sweats, weight loss. These are the things that are going to contribute to the B symptom. Presence of B symptoms definitely have to do the biopsy. And associated hepatosplenomegaly, HSM, associated hepatosplenomegaly, all these things are absolute indications for doing biopsy. And one more thing, if they ask you, um, I mean, to diagnose a lymphoma, to diagnose a lymphoma, FNAC, that is aspiration, lymph node aspiration, that is what we call FNAC or biopsy. Which will you prefer? The answer must be biopsy, always. Or which biopsy? Typically, it's better to do a excision biopsy. Very, very important. So whenever you want to diagnose a lymphoma, which means whenever there are features that are suggestive of a lymphoma, that are predictive of a lymphoma, all these features which I have told you, which are predictive of a lymphoma, always go for excision biopsy rather than a FNAC because FNAC cannot conclusively tell about the presence of a lymphoma. You know, like your biopsy is the one that is going because the architecture of the lymph node has to be understood and the cells has to be seen. So then only you can concretely diagnose a lymphoma. So that is the reason why whenever you suspect lymphoma or there are features predictive of a lymphoma, always go for a lymph node biopsy than FNAC. So these are the conditions, that's why I told you, which favor lymph node biopsy. Very important, clear? So then uh, about lymph node consistency. Lymph node consistency, remember, completely unreliable. Based on the consistency, only in surgery, that in the old textbooks, they'll give the consistency. Even in exams, sometimes it'll be useful, but clinically completely unreliable and it's not useful for any, I mean, not finding anything. Typically, you will see the hard nodes, especially if it's non-tender, it is indicative of metastasis, usually, and non-tender and fixed. You know, like hard, non-tender, fixed nodes always goes towards metastasis. Then you have a soft or firm node, usually go towards infection and rubbery consistency. In exam, if they give rubbery nodes, usually it go towards a lymphoma. Classically, old textbooks will give hot skin lymphoma as a rubbery, India rubber consistency. But uh, if you ask me, like uh, this and all consistencies and all is not going to help you really in clinical practice. That is not going to tell you whether it's a malignancy or not a malignancy. Any consistency may be seen in malignancy and lymphoma. So don't uh, go by all those things in real practice. So these are some of the important points that you have to note about the lymph nodes.